So thank you, thank you so much for having me today. Um, and uh, yeah, as I say, I'll try to keep as short as possible. So what I'm going to be talking about from a patient perspective is packaging, communication and awareness for AMR, um, because I think that uh, what has come up very prominently, I mean, this is only one pillar of the National Action Plan, but it's a very important pillar. And of course, it's also a very important pillar of the Global Action Plan. Yeah, this is going to change. There we go. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that uh, we, I'm an executive director of the AMR narrative, and I'm really excited about this because we were recently registered as a charity in the UK. And what we are focusing on is not just human health, um, but also, you know, AMR on food, AMR on animals, AMR on the environment. And the reason that we we went this direction was because as a person, um, as, as a, you know, as the public, we are um, impacted by AMR in all these different um, sections. So, you know, um, for me who had MRSA, it couldn't have just been a, a problem with, with a healthcare associated infection, but it was also a problem that could have potentially been, um, you know, come from animal uh, uh, and infection control in that area. So I'm going to go through my story very briefly, and I'm sure that some of you already know this. Um, so this is my, what I call my last photo when I was 25 years old. And very briefly after that, I had a very serious car accident. You can see on the right hand side, um, this is what the car looked like. I was a passenger in the car and I was resuscitated on the side of the road in Johannesburg. Um, I was taken to Charlotte McSake Johannesburg Academic Hospital into the high care units. Um, and I was very, very lucky to, um, even though I was suffering massive injuries, you know, not just to my face, but to my abdomen, internal bleeding, pelvic injuries and so on, um, that I was able to overcome this without any infection at that, that point in time. So I had a very long journey, I had a 10 year journey um, overcoming all the injuries, but the most complex part of it was having to reconstruct my face. And uh, I had different prosthetics implanted into my face to kind of bring back a sort of a normal anatomy. And uh, when I got the, six, the the fourth implant in my sixth year, I suddenly got this infection. And so on the left hand side, you can see, you know, I always tell the story like this. I got into my car, I was shopping in Johannesburg. I pulled down the rear view mirror and I saw this fluid coming out of my face. And I just panicked because I thought, what is this? You know, I've never seen this before and, and you know, what's going on? And um, so at that point in time, I had different doctors that were, that were seeing me, you know, because the face is a very complicated area to reconstruct. So I had a ENT surgeon, I had a plastic surgeon, I had a maxillofacial surgeon, I had an ophthalmologist, I had an ocularist, I had a neurosurgeon and so on. And, uh, you know, so I started seeing these different doctors and they, you know, each time that I would go to them, they would say, okay, we think that you need this particular surgery. So for example, the ENT surgeon would say you need sinus drainage, um, but I'm not really sure, you know, maybe go see your maxillofacial surgeon. Here is a course of antibiotics for the next 14 days. Um, and then we can make a decision on that surgery. So, you know, that would happen, for example, with a maxillofacial surgeon. We would say, you know, that implant looks okay, but I think if you do a debridement, um, it, it, you know, here's another 14 days of, of antibiotics until we get there. And of course, I was also going through different surgeries as well, because this was basically destroying my face at that point in time. So after almost a year of you know, going through different doctors and then prescribing antibiotics and going through surgeries and trying to save my face. This is what I call my, my photo, um, is my point of no return because, um, you know, you can see I've got an artificial eye, I'm, I'm, I'm partially blind. Um, I couldn't actually keep the artificial eye in, so I had to cover my face for many, many years. Um, and what actually happened was my plastic surgeon, who had built a very good relationship up with, said to me, um, I need to take that artificial implant out because that's where the infection is. And if we don't do that, I know your other doctors are giving you different advice, but if we don't do that, this infection is never going to go away. And so I thought, oh, I took him with a pinch of salt. I, I didn't, because the other doctors were disagreeing with him. And um, 
anyway, he came into surgery. He was working with the ENT surgeon. And I was going to a sinus drainage that day. And he took the implant out. And when I woke up, the ENT surgeon explained to me that this plastic surgeon had done that. And so this was kind of, you know, rang alarm bells for me. And I said, well, why did he take that risk on his shoulders? I need to understand this. And so I phoned the pathology officers and I said, please, can you send me a copy of whatever this infection is? And so that I could understand why he took it so seriously. And so they, um, back in those days, they faxed it back to me. And on the right-hand side, you can see, I mean, luckily I was still, so all the R's and S's going down, R's meant I was resistant to certain antibiotic, S's means I was still susceptible. You know, I, they could still use, use those antibiotics on me. Um, and so I started Googling, you know, I started trying to understand what was going on and up came antibiotic resistance. And then I was so sort of thrown back because I was like, why, why as a, as a high risk patient that is going through all of these different uh, prosthetic implants, not informed about this thing called antibiotic resistance, because I had never heard it before. So, um, you know, how I basically fixed my face was I went uh, and I started just, I, I panicked. You know, I thought I can't live like this. My face is just basically gone. I can't live with an iPad on, the on my face for the rest of my life. And so I started um, looking at um, medical research journals and I started writing to doctors. They were, they were you know, writing articles about uh, infection management and facial reconstructions and so on the left hand top side is a doctor called Dr Edward J Catterson he was part of the face transplant unit at Brigham and Women's Hospital so that's in, in Boston they work with Harvard and um, I was really lucky I mean I wrote I must have sent out about 50 emails um, I compiled my medical records into about four pages on the Microsoft Word document and one day his secretary got back to me and she said, um, you know, Dr. Kedison is actually willing to have a consultation with you because he sees cases you're, like yours all the time. And so he explained to me, you know, you need to do what they call the zygomatic osteotomy, meaning you cannot put any foreign objects in your face. Uh, you know, so if you look at the, the middle graphic, that's basically what they meant. They needed to cut the bone osteotomy meaning cut the bone and move it forward and um you know then basically what would happen then was it would bring the whole face back up again and so on the right hand side was in Johannesburg with the different doctors that I had the ocularist the ENT surgeon the maxillofacial surgeon you know and 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 so on to to try and make this happen for me unfortunately I did get an infection back again after we did, did the zygomatic osteotomy so this time we believed it was in the bone. Um, I had also developed an allergy from the topical um, antibiotics. So, you know, a lot of people always say oral antibiotics cause uh, resistance. But, you know, we, we forget about the fact that these antibiotics also come in creams, come in topical ointments and so on. And especially in surgery, you know, um, Bactroban is a very well-known one. Chloramex is very well-known in, in ophthalm ophthalmic surgery um, and uh, so of course I had to stop all of those and then what my maxillofacial surgeon did, did what he, was he started to rotate different types of um, antibiotics um, to try and get rid of this because obviously once it's in the bone um, you know you've got a very different type of uh, infection to deal with. So I was very lucky. I mean, it didn't enter my bloodstream. But that was our biggest uh, fears. I think one of the biggest things that my doctors did for me was to teach me, number one, how to take antibiotics properly. Um, you know, what my maxillofacial surgeon used to say to me was, you know, Vanessa, you need, if I prescribe this very end of the line antibiotic to you, like vancomycin or, you know, linozeloid or whatever, you need to wake up at five o'clock in the morning and you just set your alarm and you do not need to give that antibiotic or that bacteria a 20 minute window to mutate. And so it literally took him about 20 minutes to explain that to me, but it was so meaningful. Um, you know, sterilize your counters at home because you're not always in the hospital. I'm not always going to be with you. Um, he, he would only spend like one day a week with me, which is, which is more than what most doctors have time for, right? Um, you know, so, um, but it made the world of difference. And I think eventually um, we got rid of the infection uh, that probably took about six months after the point of time with osteomyelitis bone infection 
Um, and uh, yeah, and as I say, luckily it didn't go to bloodstream and become sepsis. So my background, um, you know, originally was in communications and marketing for uh, from about 1997. So, um, so it's about 20 years, 25 years of, of communication and marketing. And when I overcame this infection, I, I was really upset because I thought to myself, you know, when I, when I bought my antibiotics at the pharmacy, where was the warning about antibiotic resistance? Where was the conversation that I should have had with my pharmacist? Where was the conversation that I should have had with my doctors? And, you know, I've got very good relationships with all of them, uh, but why weren't we discussing this? What did it seem too scientific for me as a patient to understand? Um, but I felt that when we had that conversation, when I spoke to my maxillofacial surgeon and he explained it, I felt I could have done so much more and so this is a very big part of the advocacy that that I focus on right now is the is the communication aspect of it so um so one of the things I'm going to talk about is auditing your existing efforts and I think that's really important so we've all seen this I'm sure you've all seen this the behavior change wheel um one of the aspects of the behavior change wheel is communication and marketing and of course communication and marketing doesn't just change behavior on its own there's so many other things that do but it's a massive part of it so I'm quickly going to go through I mean this is me being a mystery patient <laughs> walking through Johannesburg hospitals and trying to see you know exactly what kind of communication is going on and and how we disseminating it because you know having a marketing background it's not just about printing posters but it's also about the dissemination of those posters and seeing whether you know whether the message is right and seeing whether they are being put in the right place so this was a hospital that i went to um in joburg that uh you know put the um the us aid poster in a back room and i was kind of like you know i mean I, I think that if we start talking about printing posters, because of course I think that traditional marketing, so posters and flyers and all of that sort of thing, needs to go hand in hand with digital marketing, because not everybody's online. Okay, not everybody likes to use social media and the website and, and website and so on. Um, but we need to understand. Okay, if we're going to put our posters up, are there certain procedures in place to measure and to understand? how patients are seeing that and how patients are um you know kind of digesting that sort of information well you know if i was a patient that wasn't looking for this in the first place i never would have seen it so it would have been money wasted you know so so whatever you do with the nap and whatever you do with communication and awareness you need to be measuring and understanding that that kind of communication needs to be very visible for patients so I always use this kind of comparison. I always say, you know, compare yourself to other industries. So, for example, the airline industry. I mean, um, you know, when you go on an airplane um, and they, you know, they give you the safety card, they normally do it in your front seat, you know, the, the seat in front of you. Um, and so why can't healthcare be the same? Because um, there were many times that I read about RPC and hand washing at the sink. But I was sitting in high care. I was I was immobile. I, you know, I was in a bed. I couldn't move around. So, you know, that that to me benefited people that could walk around, patients that could walk around, um, or healthcare professionals that could go to the sink and wash their hands. But I didn't have that luxury. I was lying in bed. I couldn't move around. So I think that we need to start thinking about when we talk about RPC. As soon as a patient lands in the hospital. Um, what is their journey and how are you going to educate them about RPC um, from the point where they are sitting? So, again, going back to the airline, when you're sitting in an airplane seat, you, you can't just walk around and, you know, you can't just put the safety card in the bathroom because it's not going to benefit everybody. It needs to be in front of them. So, again, Think about your procedures, your dissemination procedures. Is it just going to be about awareness raising or is it going to be about how we actually disseminate that and how we get in front of patients to the point that they feel that they are part of the RPC, part of the AMR journey? And so 
Yeah, I mean, I've heard quite a lot about um, social media, and this is a major thing for those that have access, the privilege and access to the internet. Um, and it is very, very meaningful. Um, you know, uh, but then again, you know, I've seen a lot of things that have been disseminated on the internet that have been very scientific, um, you know, and I think that we need to also be thinking about how do we, you know, take that information and make it more um, digestible for somebody that's that's online, you know, especially as a patient that knows nothing about MR. So, um, so this is actually a photo, you know, I talked about the posters in Joburg Hospital, Charlotte McSeke, and how it was disseminated incorrectly. So again, me being a mystery patient, I go into, I, and I live in the UK, and I've started to see how they do things differently here. Um, and uh, one thing that they do do is they, they they take a whole lot of other charities and the charities put their, their flyers together. And, you know, so you'll find one AMR pamphlet in between all of these. And, you know, I started thinking to myself, well, you know, there's so many disease areas that could be impacted by AMR. Why are we trying to do one flyer when we could be working with all these charities and getting the, the, the communication out with all those charities by forming partnerships and forming relationships with them, even if it's just a very small, um, you know, uh, insert about what AMR is, because this is a massive topic. And if we only focus on one disease area, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. And if we if we also only focus on AMR as an individual problem, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. So my advice to you would be work with civil society, work with patient partners, work with charities to try and disseminate the AMR information, not just through one channel, but through many. So this is another example of a, of a GP surgery in, in, um, in England. And again, you know, I like to use this because I come from South Africa where we, we, we go into the doctor's rooms, we go into the, you know, Charlotte McSeke, um, you know, I've been to many, many public health uh, hospitals in Joburg and, you know, so many flyers that we could be, we could be targeting the public with. And I think that that's really important because we did the same with COVID. Why aren't we doing the same with AMR? So, um yeah so this is again going back to the the healthcare professional talking to the patient um I, I always raise that because i think that your doctor or your pharmacist or your nurse and, and that's why i love to see that you guys are doing capacity building because we those are the first people that we approach and the questions come from that but i think it's not just questions because you don't always know what to ask if you don't know what you, you know, I mean, when I had MRSA, I didn't know I had MRSA, I only found out about it because I asked for a test. But if you are aware of it, you can start asking these health professionals questions. Um, and I think that that dialogue needs to be established um, in some way so that, you know, so that people understand, patients understand, the public understand exactly what this means. So UX and UI design, so user design experience comes down to, for example, working with patients themselves. And, it, you know, I know that it's not always easy because patients might not completely understand. So that's why I also talk about working with charities, um, you know, working with patient charities, patient groups, um, where you can ask them, for example, well, what is the what is the patient experience? And so design thinking as a five stage process empathize, understand what people are going through, define the problem, ideate and prototype and test and go back again. So you know, on the right hand side um, is kind of that whole process that um, the Interaction Design uh, Foundation talks about. And again, this comes from a marketing experience. You know, when we when we design customer, um, user, you know, consumer, user friendly materials, this is a process that we use. And I think that you know, when it comes to patients, again, whether you have TB, whether you have aspergillosis, whether you have CEDA, whether you have MRSA, what is that patient journey? And, you know, like if you see a flyer, or if you see a, a website and so on, how would you like to see that done? Um, and I think that's really important. And of course, that even delves even deeper into culture and, um, you know, faith and so on. So, so, so having said that, this is a photo of a user design workshop that we had at Stanford University. So I completed a, um, an e-patient scholarship 
with them in 2017 and I went back again in 2019 in Silicon Valley. Um, and they are just, I mean, they're so like sort of advanced, you know, where, where it comes to, you know, uh, how do we design things? How do we design a mobile medical application? How do we design a website and so on? Well, we design it with the end user. Um, you know, to make it most effective. So, so this particular workshop that I was sitting in here was um, a group of RT developers, healthcare professionals, um, patients, uh, you know, uh, designers, and so on, to come up with this ultimate uh, mobile application that was for o OCPD. Uh, so it was for respiratory tract infection, COPD. Sorry, COPD. And so this was also another um, research article that I worked on where um, it was a great example, again, for the Africa CDC, um, where we worked on a survey. So they sent me the survey beforehand and they said, Vanessa, what do you think the right questions are to ask these CSOs? Um, you know, and again, I mean, they sent it off to the other CSOs and, you know, ultimately the questions then are more tailored to the individual's experience. So, yes, here's another example. I mean, we we came up with our first video, you know, in, in South Africa for Antibody Guardian because we 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 try to implement that in South Africa. And again, it was myself, uh, a, a professor of medical anthropology and a professor of medical microbiology. We all work together to try and figure out, OK, this is me as a patient that I have this idea in my mind, but I need it to be brought back by scientific, you know, professionals to it's, it's a very minor, it's a very minor example. But, you know, again, how do we stay away from this very scientific discussion about AMR? Because it can become very, very scientific. Um, and so what we really, what I was really proud about is this, that this antibiotic guardian was eventually adopted by the Minister of Health in South Africa. Um, and um, yeah, there was a lot of hard work to get that done. So why does inf in AMR infodemic matter? Um, <clears throat> for those who don't know what the infodemic is, I think you probably, I think you do, because COVID taught us when we start talking about the next pandemic and the last pandemic and so on, it's also important to understand about how to manage the information, how to manage awareness, how to manage communication. And, you know, so what an infodemic basically means is not just misinformation, but it also means um, disinformation, misinformation and overflow of information. So it might not just be, you know, that somebody's posting false information, but it could also be that there's too much scientific information where people don't really grasp the concept at the end of the day, and that's an infodemic. Um, it's also a very big part of the infodemic, and it's something that we need to be very mindful of. Um, so I'll give you an example. I mean, this week I had somebody say to me, um, what is antimicrobial resistance? You've got to teach me because I'm a lay person. I don't understand what this is. Is it is it something to do with the anti-vaccine drive? And I was like, no, it's antimicrobial resistance. Well, teach me what what is it? And I started having to say it's you know anti-parasitics, it's anti-fungals, and we are actually pro. We're actually trying to you know save these medications. We're not you know we're not an anti-vaccine movement. Um, this is when I was talking to him about the the charity, and so you know so just asking the public, asking people, what, what do you think antimicrobial resistance is, gives you some really fascinating answers and it helps you to understand what you're going to be, how you're going to be planning your communication, how you're going to be planning your marketing going forward. So again, going back to the definitions, um, it could be information overload, disinformation, misinformation, rumors. So the difference quickly between misinformation and disinformation is disinformation is something that's created, for example, by terrorist groups or by um, you know people that really want to try and um, create havoc in the system. <laughs> Whereas mis misinformation would probably be something that you know your mom shares by accident because she believes in the disinformation that she's seen. And usually misinformation is a lot more dangerous than what this you know disinformation is because you know if you believe something you start sharing with everybody on your network so stories we always talk about stories and this is one of the reasons why we chose the word you know the term or the name the amr narrative because you know what really means a lot is how we tell our stories and not just from patient perspectives but also from healthcare perspectives healthcare professional perspectives um 
it brings meaning to something um you know and um so another thing that's really important is as so i thought i'd mention this research as well is because language is important um and so this was a study done by um, some colleagues of mine, Adrian Brink and Natalie Schleck, where they kind of sat down and they said, well, how do we understand the term antibiotic? Uh, and so language is really important. And I don't think that I need to mention that because we know Africa has so many diverse languages. Um, you know, how do we, when we communicate that, you know, and we start talking about AMR, um, you know, where exactly do we sit with that? So I really think that a lot more studies like this are necessary. And so, yeah, I mean, use technology online again. I mean, we've had this problem for a long time. Uh, you know, I've looked up my symptoms on Google and I think I've got 8,300 life-threatening diseases. We have been self-diagnosing ourselves for a long time as patients, you know, ever since the internet opened, which was back in the 1990s. Um, so my e-patient scholarship again, uh, was all about e-patients and what that was really about um, this is the e-patient white paper um, is about participatory medicine so you know when you educate patients when they are able to participate um, so for you know so for example going back to behavior change doesn't change behavior but when you are empowered and you're educated enough to have the uh, privilege of making a decision so for example you know I used to I used to smoke but when I knew that smoking caused cancer and was it was caused I could make a more informed decision than I actually quit smoking um, it doesn't happen for everybody okay that, that isn't the way it happens for everybody but but why shouldn't we have that that information that helps us do that and that makes us empowered to become more you know um, emancipated patients so the E has 10, uh, you know, goals to it, uh, empowered, engaged, equal, emancipated, educated, evaluated, expert, enabled, equipped, and electronic. So um, I'd really, you know, say to you, go and look at that. When you start to design um, meaningful interventions for patients, start thinking about these things because, um, you know, educated, emancipated, what does that mean? You know, emancipated means that I can make those more informed decisions because of the type of communication and marketing that you're providing me, especially on digital technology so for example here's a good example of emancipated e-patient um you know we know in diabetes for example people are managing their health a lot better because of mobile applications but they need to be designed in the correct way and that's why it's so important to work with patients to design those mobile applications again engaged what does that mean well engaged could mean that the technology is um you know is, is much more meaningful so that they actually enjoy the experience and then finally, you've got to listen, track, and measure before implementation. So again, like I said, print marketing. Um, think about where you put your um, where you put your posters, where you put your flyers. Think about ways to measure the the outcome and impact of those flyers. Maybe use a a website which they could go on and um, you know, and, or you know, surveys or you know maybe even talk about a patient public involvement advisory where they could contribute. Um, in England, we've got, uh, we've got ways that people can become engaged in PPI advisory groups to share their experiences about flyers and, and, and posters and so on in their doctor's offices. <coughs> Digital marketing, marketing is a little bit easier. The start that I have um, where we did our tweet check for um, the AMR narrative and we had about 3.7 million impressions and that was really important because we asked patients about their feedback so i think there i'm going to end thank you very much